Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Little Bitty Podcast, episode number 158 of the show. I'm Ramon Mia. I'm not here to bring you the latest lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. This week I have seven new lit RPG reviews just for you folks at home. And that includes uh, His Staff, a sci-fi lit RPG skeleton in space book number one. Uh, this is the latest publication from Mountain Dale Press, uh, which is one by the a wonderful Dakota Kraut. Uh, also out this week is Viridian Gate Online Nomad Soul, a little bit of adventure, The Illusionist, book number one. This is uh, an expanded universe novel from um, Shadow Alley Press, uh, which is uh, James Hunter's uh, publishing company. Uh, and this is the first um, release in the expanding universe. So this is written by a different author, different main character, um, and it kind of tells its own story, but it's, it's still in the same universe. I'll let you know how what I thought about this particular novel later. Uh, also reviewing this week, Beta Life Digital Sorcery, book number one. Also, Star Exile, Singularity, a sci-fi little bit adventure. Uh, then it'll be Scourge of Souls, The Realms, book number four. Then it's going to be Gemini's Crossing, a fantasy liturgy game lit adventure in Nora Online, book number one. And then The Dungeon Traveler. Uh, so seven new little bit stories, all uh, pretty, pretty thick. Um, so before we get to that, though, we're going to go into the RPG news. And in little RPG news, we're going to begin with a story from Magic Dome Books, uh, the latest novel from Dan Sugarloff, uh, Sugralinov. <laughs> uh, they help me with the pronunciation. Um, Class A Threat will be available on a new Russian subscription service called litnet.com. Um, and it will be published a uh, chapter a day or every other day until the entire thing is ready and available. Uh, so if you want to read it early, you can get it. You can get it there. We'll link the show notes for you to go check it out. Uh, but this particular story, um, which is called again, Class A Threat, uh, it's the first book in the Discardium series, um, is actually scheduled to publish on Amazon in April. Uh, and so when that pre-order, when that publish came for Amazon, comes through, apparently going to pull it off of uh, litnet.com so that it, it can get that key exclusivity and, and follow all those rules for Amazon. Uh, but if you if you just can't wait uh, the next couple months, basically, uh, to, to read that novel because you like um, Dan's work, you can definitely check this out at litnet.com. I'm also actually going to be talking to uh, the same author um, tomorrow, um, as of this recording. It'll be on Friday the 22nd, um, talking about Level Up. That series, and of course, this one here that I just mentioned, and his work as a Little Bridge author. It'll be an author interview, so uh, feel free to drop any questions you might have for the author on this page, or you know, check out the interview tomorrow. I'll be posting the links to the live view of it um, on Little Bridge Podcast's uh, Facebook page, Twitter, um, so you can have plenty of ways to watch it live. It'll be in like the middle of the day, though, so I'm not sure everybody can watch it, but even after that, I'll be putting up as a podcast later uh, at a later date, so there you go. Um, also in Little Bridgie News, we have the rest of the stories revolve around Dakota Kraut and Mountain No Press. And he's been doing a lot of interviews actually with um, his latest authors and also the authors from Shout Out Ali Press. They have a co mingled Facebook page. And so Dakota is actually talking to the author of His Snap, which we're reviewing today on the show. Um, but it's actually coming out tomorrow on February 22nd. Um, and so he's interviewing the author on the Mountain Dale Press a Facebook page. Um, Michael um, and Michael Chad apparently is also going to be showing as a guest uh, commentator, host, uh, uh, talker. Uh, but they're talking to Andres Luis. Um, and I hope I'm saying his name right, but he's the author of his staff. Um, last week, though, um, a different novel from Mountain Dale Press came out. Uh, and Dakota Crowd talked to that author, uh, Ryan DeBrain. And they had a nice conversation. It was about Equalize, which did really well on Amazon when it came out last week. Uh, and then third, uh, Dakota Crowd talked to the three new um, authors in the expanded Reading Gate Online universe, um, which was DJ Bowden from the Illusionist series, JD Astro for the Fireman series, and NH Paxson for the Alchemic Weaponry series. The only one that's actually come out is the Illusionist um, from DJ Bowden, DJ Bowden, rather. We're reviewing them on the show today. But Dakota Crowd talked to all of them um, as as 
not only an author and also a publisher, um, but also as a fan of this video series in the universe. And all three authors were very nice, that very interesting to say, so definitely go check it out. But all three are, again, writing um, independent, well, semi-independent. They're, they're writing stories in the Reading Online universe, but they're not with those same Reading Online characters necessarily. They're all independent um, main characters, different storylines. And so it's definitely like this expanded universe kind of thing going on. So there you go. Uh, on to stuff that is out now. Um, haven't reviewed it, haven't read it, uh, but it is out now, including Oliver May's uh, Occultist Saga Online from Portal Books. They've been doing some very nice celebrity stuff. So that is out now, both as an, well, it's also as an ebook and an audiobook. Um, we'll talk about audiobooks later. Also out now is Dissonance, Somnia Online, book number four, as is the Guardian Guild Dungeon Core, um, Station Core is book number three. Also out um, on February 22nd, which is when most people watch this, is going to be Hunter's Choice, Apex Chronicles, book number two. I I couldn't get to it. Uh, the author gave me an advanced copy. I just couldn't get it in the schedule, so I'll have to wait to review it next week. Uh, also out now is the second book in the Anora online series. Uh, it'll be out on February 22nd as well. We're reviewing book no- number one on the show today, but book two, Quest for Roshan, is out tomorrow. Uh, also out now is Quest Accepted, XP Unlocked, book number one. Also out is A Demon Lord's Virtual Life. This is the second book in that series called First War. I know it says First War, but it's technically the second book in that series. Um, so there you go. Also out is Void Legion, a Liturgy Gamelet Song of the Frost Files, book number one. It There's a cover. It has an elf with a Gatling gun. So there you go. Uh, also out now is the third book in the replay series. Uh, it's actually a short story series uh, called First Forest. And um, uh, this is actually a dungeon core story with Light Harem from Shadow Alley Press, the folks that bring you um, Rooting and Lion and all those expanding universe series. Also the uh, War God Mantle, a bunch of other stuff um, run by um, James Hunter. This is called Dungeon Bringer one and again this is the kind of the, the company's first foray into anything harem-y. Um and the author did like a nice synopsis of like oh this is totally crunchy lit pg light harem no sex and we'll see how this goes uh so there it is it's out now for you uh the second book in the loot rpg series from deck davis called code the necromancer is out now i actually enjoyed book number one it was a very interesting take on um fantasy <laughs> fantasy world with RPG mechanics in there, um, but everything in the stories from a native's point of view, nobody's portaled in, nobody's stuck in a game. It's just this world happens to be run by RPG mechanics and the story revolves around a necromancer and culture and a bunch of other cool things. So this is the second book in that series. Um, also out is the Goblin Horde, Little Bridge Adventure, Tower of Power, book number two. So that's all out. Okay. In audiobooks, we have a company releases as well. Uh, Little Bridge Audiobooks, we have uh, The Curse, The Realms Between, book number one by Phoenix Gray is out as an audiobook. Uh, the Occultist, which you mentioned as an ebook, also as an audiobook. So good for Portal. Um, Portal, that's the name of the publishing company for getting this out as an audiobook at the same time as ebook. Uh, also, as an audiobook is The Idol System, The New Journey. So there you go, a bunch of stuff for audiobook listeners to enjoy. Okay, in the upcoming Letter BG, this is just where I read a bunch of stuff that's coming out in the near future with some release dates, as far as I know them. Um, we're going to be in with uh, Everborn, book number two, called Collide, out on February 22nd. I'm sorry, February 24th of 2019. Um, Cat's Quest, book number one. Um, this novel title changed a little bit, same off of those same links. It'll be out on February 26th. This is a translated work from um, a Russian, I think. Also out on February 26th, it'll be Reading Gate Online, Firebrand. And again, this is another one of those expanded universe stories. Um, on February 28th, Awaken Online Dominion. Um, on March the 5th, The Black Turtle, The Atar Chronicles, book number two. March the 5th, it'll be um, Dark Sun Survival from Dave Wilmarth. On March the 12th, it'll be Vindication, The Alchemic Weapon, or book number one. Uh, again, the third um, expanded universe novel for the Reading Gate Online series. On March the 15th, it'll be The Plague Barons, which is the third book in the Inora you know, Online series, right? So book number one is reviewed today. Book number two came out tomorrow, and this will be book number three if you're a fan of that series out on March the 15th. Um, on March the 18th, it'll be Absolute Zero, Animal Line book number one. March the 25th, The Final Trial, Level Up book number three by Dan Sugra. I already forgot. Sorry. I already forgot to say his name properly. Um, on March the 26th, it'll be Rudy Online. Liberty Gentry, The Illusionist, book number two. That's right, book number one did so well, they're already 
making plans for book number two. They already have it written apparently, and it's it's this is when it's going to come out. There's no actual pre-order yet on it. Uh, this is just an announcement from from the publishing company, Shadow Alley Press. Uh, on March 27th, The Dark World Transformation Book Number Two, uh, April the first, and I'm hoping this isn't like an April Fool's joke. I really am. Uh, but it's end of the game dungeon crawl quest, a literary adventure wizard warrior quest out on April the first, 2019. So. There you go. Uh, on April the 5th, it'll be the second book in the... No, no actually, I have to say, I have to <laughs> admit, apparently I was saying the, the name of the uh, the monsters, the the djinn, uh, the entire, entirely incorrectly last podcast, I kept saying dinjin because there's a D in there, and I, I just forgot that the D is supposed to be silent, it's just supposed to be djinn, and I had a number of people writing to the podcast saying, hey, buddy, just letting you know, you're saying this wrong. The D is silent. And, and so... I absolutely admit that. I, I actually need that, I think. And I just, I'm getting old. And so things are just forgetting <laughs> in my mind. But the second book in the in the Jin Tamers rivals a monster battling game lit adventure. Um, Jin Tamer Bronzely, book number two, an amazingly long title, will be out on April the 5th, 2019. Uh, on April the tw- 10th, it'll be Edge of the Abyss, Respawn Trials, book number one. Uh, on April the 11th, the fifth book in the Good Guy series, Dukes and Ladders, a uh, little bit game, little adventure. Um, I was I was hoping to be able to review book four in this series this week. Again, just ran out of time. I did seven other novels and I just, you know, and they're all like three or 400 pages each. So I'm like, oh no, I just ran out. So I'm hoping to read book number four this week and review it on the podcast next week. Um, but the fifth book has a pre-order um, April the 11th, 2019. On April the 16th, Soul Catcher, Little Beauty Series Universe, ICS, book number one will be out. On April the 18th, it'll be Dragon Heart, Stone Will, Little RPG, uh, Wuxia Series, book number one. That'll be out. On April the 22nd, Class A Threat, Discardian, book number one. This is that other series from Dan. Um, I would just, I'm just going to say Dan, from Dan, uh, who I'll be talking to uh, t- later this week, tomorrow. On uh, April the 25th, the second book in the Galacticon series, In Search of the Aldens. Uh, that'll be out on, again, April the 25th. There you go. That, that's all the stuff I know that's coming in the near future, folks, the next couple months. Uh, feel free to grab your pre-orders, support your authors you like. Uh, on to new releases and reviews. Hey, and new releases and reviews we're going to begin with. His Staff, a sci-fi lit RPG, Skeleton in Space, book number one. Uh, again, this is actually technically out tomorrow on February 22nd. We're recording this on Thursdays, which is when we record the show. Um, it is written by Andres uh, Lowe's, and apparently, I might be saying it incorrectly, but I don't mean to, so I'm doing my best. Um, here we go. It is 314 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Lots of bone, broken bones, a dim-witted RPG system, a, and a dash of magic is skeleton in space. Douglas is a simple summon skeleton formed from an old battlefield when some ancient fossil of a necromancer raised him for a nefarious purpose. His memories are a bit foggy, but who cares about remembering when there, there is walking to be done or stabbing cows? Douglas loves life and the simple joy of doing repetitive tasks. Like battering down a large tower door is all that's needed to keep his clacking bones satisfied. But just after he's completed his most recent task, the wizard he was fighting took out a weird crystal, and now there are stars everywhere. Will the floating, freezing skeleton find out what happened, or will that wrecked spaceship on a collision path be the last thing going through his empty skull? Come join Douglas, the magical skeleton, as he tries to live a filling, a fulfilling life in a sci-fi universe. And if that sounds confusing to you folks, uh, that combination of fantasy and sci-fi, you're not going to be alone. It was for me too. Um, full disclosure, I received an advanced copy for review. I purchased a copy. Wait a minute. Actually, I haven't had this on pre-order for weeks. Um, so there we go. Um, and I'll be honest, when I read the beginning of this story, I was definitely confused. Like the beginning is a little hard to wrap your head around what exactly is happening. Like eventually it's sort of explained by the end of the story, uh, but the beginning section um it's really converting two different concepts two different genres um and for the novel on the whole i was a little torn about whether i actually had a good time reading it and whether what kind of scores that was very much in the middle like 
is this a 6.9? Uh, which I just read as a six out of 10, or is this going to be like a 7.1? I'm like, er, this is like, it was very much on the fence for me. And I, and I, I definitely like think the snowball has a certain charm and a certain sense of humor, but I'd also think that it's not going to work for everybody. I'm not going to details as to like what things I think people will enjoy and other things that I think people might have a hard time getting into. Um, this is essentially a slice life story where the main character is an ended skeleton. He's summoned on a sword and sorcery RPG fantasy world. That's very clear in the meeting. Um, and by some word conflux of events, this part's a little confusing to be honest. He ends up in a sci-fi universe and it's a very clear distinction. Like one minute he's, He's in this battle, and this is in the novel description, so it's not a spoiler. He's in this novel, he's in this fantasy setting, he's fighting a bunch of you know, wizards and warriors and whatever cast, and then suddenly he's floating in space, and he sees you know stars everywhere, and the sun, or like a, a, a sun. And eventually he falls into this derelict spaceship, and it turns very much, it becomes a sci-fi universe. Um, part of the story is that the, that the skeleton becomes self-aware and he uses the RPG system to evolve in a different kind of skeleton in the forms, gain skills, a class, and magic. Um, and the story focuses mostly on the skeleton main character exploring and training his magic. That's, that's essentially most of what the story is. Um, and if that's okay with you, if you love that kind of stuff, if you love like long pages and pages of stuff where like the main character is just magical theorizing or like um, contemplating how the universe is working and how he's trying to figure out how to like reconnect all his bone pieces multiple times in the story, then you're going to enjoy the story. You really will. Um, but if that kind of introspective thought processes, um, sounds boring to you, if you prefer more action, you might just want to skip this. Um, because a lot of the stuff that the main character does, he explores a derelict spaceship and then a space station full of like monsters that remind me of the kind of monsters from Dead Space. Um, and eventually he gets a companion, but again, there's very little communication between them. And it, the stories is only slightly less lonely than when the main character is by. So like at, at the most, there are like two characters, like two talking characters in the story ever. And most of it is just the main character by himself, looking, exploring, reading stuff a lot of introspective like thought process of like exploring his own abilities and his, especially the magic system that comes up eventually um and that's like a, a big portion of the story essentially it, like changes in point of view to the companion side and her whole deal and there's like a very like I said, it can be like some interesting connections there but um a lot of it is very introspective or just like lonely descriptions of like oh one person tribute and doing things um Let's see. Um, there is a little combat in the story, but it's not exciting. Um, and, and and I'm saying it's not exciting in the sense that it's not not that there's like some some of the regular stuff in that. It kind of goes one of two ways through the entire story. Like either the main character blasts away the monsters in an instant, or he gets smacked around, his body's crushed and broken, and he spends the next couple pages like putting himself back together. And that's kind of the only two outcomes in the story for for combat. And it's not particularly. Um, exciting it does exist and again it's semi-regularish but it's not like i said it's not the big thing in the story and it's not a, a good majority of the story either um and i'll be honest um the parts where the main character is describing how he's putting himself together it happens a lot like it's a significant portion of the story it's like i noticed like oh this is redescribed again and again and again it's one of those parts that i wish would have been somewhere like a tiny bit more because uh, the first time it happened in the a story great i loved learning about how the main character is using his mana to like rebuild himself. Great. Uh, but the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eight, nine, ten 10th time, I'm like, okay, I, I've heard this before. Um, and there are like a few variations, like additional abilities that happen to it faster, but I, I don't need like the longer description of the entire thing. It's a small thing. Um, there we go. Um, and, and I think part of that is actually like a, supposed to be like a humorous gag about how often his body's broken up. Um, so maybe it's a joke that I'm just like, oh, not quite getting. Um, but, you know, it's there. Uh, let's see. Uh, the RPG mechanics are pretty standard, and they seem regular in the story. Um, character sheets, XP levels, mana, stats, skills, the whole shebang. The main character is a monster, so he also gets evolutions once he hits uh, his current race uh, levels cap, like uh, level cap. Um, and fortunately, I don't think this is really done well. I mean, this is not really explored as, as interesting as possible. And that all the evolutions that the main character goes through, they're not particularly striking or different. And I feel like it's kind of a wasted mechanic. I mean, it's definitely used for 
in other parts of the story that I'm not going to spoil for you in different ways. But for a lot of the story, it's just like, oh, you have these evolutionary choices and the choices that make character mates aren't super amazing and different. I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's a choice. Um, also, the RPG stuff for a lot of the story feels like it's not as important as I was hoping it was going to be. And, and it's consistently used and it's seen regularly, but I got the feeling if it was removed, the story really wouldn't be like a lot different. Like the, there were definitely like scenes that would be different and that the author would have to like rewrite them. But a lot of the story focuses more on the ruined magic system and not so much on the RPG recursion. I, I think again... Um, that's a deliberate choice. Like there are definitely some, I think some gags in there and the story that are like making fun of the RPG mechanic system. That's trying to figure out its place and how to describe all these, um, sci-fi creatures in a way. And so like part of that is probably intentional. Um, but again, you kind of get the feeling like, Oh, this XP number is completely made up and it doesn't make sense compared to like what the, what type of like super difficult monster fight the main character had. Um, and especially in like some of the, places in the story like oh this main character got like this super high amount of experience points and it's forcing him into this evolution of uh, this this evolutionary choice of like oh now you can do an evolution choice and th that's what it felt like sometimes like the the experience points were just there and and inflated sometimes to force like an advancement of some rpg progression system you know what i mean and that's fine and again i this is sort of explained a little bit later in the show, like why this feels arbitrary. And I think that might be part of like in the storyline, it just felt a little bit off for me. Um, overall, I think the story just came down on this side of good for me, but again, it was really close for me. Um, I like the interesting mix of fantasy and sci-fi. I'm okay with the slice life story where you're just following the main character around. Um, but the early in the story, things are a little bit tedious. Uh, when the main character is literally floating around in space for like 16% of the novel, um, reading manuals reforming his scale to body and i'm like oh that's a lot of time to not really do much um the magical theorizing story is good once it gets there and i thought the magic system was kind of neat however um other readers might not enjoy the slower piecing the story and the lack of combat so i think those are things that people might um skip on the story if those are things that they're looking for specifically um for me gets a score 7.1 out of 10 that's his staff a sci-fi lit rpg a skeleton in space book number one with a score of seven oops, score 7.1 out of 10 there you go okay on to the next review it is Rooting it online, Nomad Soul, a little bit of adventure, The Illusionist, book number one, written by DJ Bowden. It is a 329 page, it is $4.99 It is available in Kim Limited. And here's the author's description. If you had to choose between your life and your dreams, would you ever wake up? Alan Campbell thought he'd gotten his dream job working on a revolutionary VR MMORPG with Osmark Technologies. Until the project was cancelled. He has one weekend to dive into an untested world full of intrigue, violence, and corruption to prove that Viridian Gate Online works, but the AIs running the game have their own plans for his soul. Set a year before the events of Viridian Gate Online Cataclysm, the illusionist Nomad Soul takes you back to when VGO was just a game, or so it seemed. So there we go, and this is basically, there's a little blurb at the end saying, oh, this is an expanding universe story in the Viridian Online universe. So there you go. Um... <laughs> that's the first part where he says, this is an expanded universe series set <laughs> in the Freddy Online universe. It's set one year before the first book in that main series. Um, and I'll be honest, initially I was a little unsure of how I would feel about this story. I think at the game of the publishers was a little like, are people going to like this? Is it going to fit in with their expectations of the, of the VGO universe? Um, and I think they were actually doing it. I had a conversation with um, several of the people over there at, at Shadow of the Press, and they were really happy with how well this, this novel has been doing. I think it hit, um, I'm, I'm I think they told me, but I think it hit like sub 300 um, for like how well it did it at one point in the novel's like release date. So like really good for them. Um, it seems like the fans have, have been accepting this particular expanding universe novel. And then personally, I was a little unsure as well. Um, I was I was super worried that how consistent this was going to be um, with like established canon and the RPG mechanics and if it was going to be consistent. And thankfully, after reading the story, I'm glad I said this fits right into, uh, right in with all the other novels in the series. Um, I'm as honestly really impressed with how much trust and leeway the publishers gave to the author. Um, they let him use like 
major series characters and not just for like cameos, but also for like serious canon stuff. Like the authors, the, the publishers um, gave this author the use of like, like I said, really big characters, like characters you're going to know from VGO um, and, and the things they do in that within the story is now canon. And I'm like, that's, that's a huge amount of trust that James Hunter, who's the, owner of, of that series and all the property on, on all the characters and titles um, has given this author. And I think, you know, it turned out really well, uh, or at least it turned out um, better than my lowest expectations or like, I think I, it met my expectations. We'll say that um, the story is set before the asteroid hits the earth and Viridi, uh, and the Viridian get MMO world is still in its alpha stages. Um, it's starting its testing phase in this particular storyline. Um, the main character is trying to save the project and prove that the interface issues can be worked out by staying in the game pro over the weekend. In game, it's a fairly standard, it's fairly a slice of life story that focuses on world building, character development, and intrigue. The main character has to navigate a world, uh, the, a world the controlling AI gods have been influenced in building as the very first player or traveler. Um, you get lots of information about the imperial side of 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 the imperial side of the storyline, including history, some small personal stories, architectural details and customs. And some readers have actually complained there's probably a little bit too much of this for them. Um, and I can kind of see where they're coming from. Like they're really this like multiple places and they switch to the first story where it's like, Oh, hey, look, here's another detail. And here's a new character. And Oh, look, here's their backstory. Even though I'm never going to see them again. Um, and so there's a little bit of that. Um, also there's some in-game intrigue storyline between different Imperial factions that the main characters to deal with. And the author does a really good job of describing a faction or a place that the video, that the main video series has been sparse about. Like, um, when I was reading this, I basically realized, oh, you know what? I've never heard this side of the story. I've never heard this history of the Imperial side, or I've never heard a description of this capital city. It's like, oh, this is really nicely flushed out things that add. Um, if you, if you were a fan of the Virgin Galline series, the main one by, by James Hunter, you're going to appreciate this little like peek into a different side of that universe. Um, but at the same time, the author is, is kind of creating his own, his own like space for his story, which I think is nice. Um, the one aspect that I say is probably lacking in the story is action. Um, when there's action in the story, it's really good. It really is enjoyable, but there's just not a lot of it. I think there's in the first half of the story, there's probably one or two smaller scenes of action. Um, and later on in the story, I think there's, I think that well, it's probably like only four or five action scenes. Now that I think about it in, in the entire like novel and they're well done. It's just like, if you're coming in the story, hoping for as much action as you got in the main brooding alien series, you're going to be disappointed because this one is definitely a little more of a setup series or setup novel where he's describing the universe. He's doing a lot of backstory creation. He's, he's fo the author just focusing on like intrigue plot lines that are going to be built later in the series. Um, and you know, that, that's just kind of the way it goes. Um, in the real life storyline, um, plot lines on the story. It's mostly just about getting the game to work and proving that it can pop. It's not, um, for most of the story, it's not super intense. Um, there's definitely some tension in like, get, in trying to prove that the, uh, Viridian get project is successful. Um, and there's some interesting twists, which I'm not going to spoil, but, um, for a lot of the story, like, oh, they are, the real life journalists, at least not the major thing pushing this forward. Um, on the game mechanic side, um, you're going to see that everything that's here is definitely in line and consistent with the main Viridian Alien series. So the publishers did a really good job, I think, of making sure that there's consistent formatting, consistent um, descriptions of powers that are fitting in within the like the, the Viridian uh, online universe without like anything being too um, overpowered necessarily. Like everything's really pretty fair, well balanced out. But um, relative to the size of the story and relative to the main series I think the, the RPG stuff is a little lighter than I thought it was going to be. Um, there's actually only, I think two times in the entire story. If you see a character sheet for the main character, there's semi regular notifications for quests and skills and items um, that all exist in the story, but the story doesn't focus on RPG progression. Um, it's, it's more of again, kind of an incidental effect of the main character adventuring. And it's more like informational notifications for, for the most part. Um, and also like the quest kind of guiding the adventurer and the kind of the revelation of that. Oh yeah. The, the game AI is, is kind of influencing the main character and like the quest that he's being given specifically. Um, and again, this is really in line with how the story is set up in that this is the alpha phase 
of the game world. So that kind of makes sense to a degree. However, again, readers that love like all the crunchiness of the main video series, they may be a little disappointed with the lack of it here. That may change in future novels, obviously. Um, overall, it's a good story. It's a little light on action and RPG, but it does some really good stuff with world building and intrigue and character development. So uh, that's probably a plus on the side. So for me, you get to score 7.3 out of 10. Had a good time with it. Um, so that's reading it online. Nomad Soul, a little bit of adventure. The Illusion is book number one with the score 7.3 out of 10. So there you go. Okay. Next. It is Beta Life, Digital Sorcery, book number one, a lit RPG series written by David M. Zahn. It is 282 pages. It is $3.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. And here's the author's description. Old and about to die, Christopher Ryland is digitized in the new beta program offered by the Everlast Corporation. The beta promises eternal life in a video game. But as Rylan is sued to discover, he should have read the instruction manual first. The corporation failed to mention that it has populated his new world with slavers, sadists, and supremacists. And one very trollish elf. All right, that last one wasn't really their fault. Sure, he might live forever, but with the serious lack of RPG knowledge, this isn't going to be, fun, be the fun and relaxing retirement he imagined. He might not be the world's greatest gamer, but he won't let anything keep him down, not even fish herpes. So there we go. I think the, the novel description kind of teases you a little bit with, with the, um, I think it's distinguishing factors going to be, which is kind of a sense of humor. Um, the beginning of the story is a little, uh, it's kind of, it, there's a huge info number at the beginning of this novel. There's another way to describe it. Um, but once the main character is in the game world, the story actually becomes a, a bit better. Um, the RPG stuff in the novel is overall described well. Um, it's detailed and the, Mechanics actually seem to have an impact on the story, like they're designed to have an impact. Like the main character can't do things well unless he will spend a skill point on certain characteristics, certain skills. So he has those abilities. And I thought that was a nice little little touch to make those RPG mechanics like feel impactful. Uh, but for most of the story is really just kind of slice of life. Follow the main character, goes on some adventures, does some things, has some humorous events and some commentary. Um, and that, that's fine with me. Um, the thing that I think is going to set the story apart from other novels is going to be the humor. Um, there's a good kind of gamer vibe to the storyline and, 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 and the characters like talking and progression. Um, and one character in particular is probably going to be either really like the, the character that makes you enjoy the story or makes you put it down and say, I don't like this. And that's going to be the character called elder tits. That's right. That's the character's name. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, and the, it's described in the novel description as like, Oh, a trollish elf. And that kind of fits like this character is kind of the most interesting part of the story and the same head's probably the most off putting part of the story. Um, that character tells all the jokes and makes all the sense of humor. It makes the, it kind of elevates, I think the story a little bit from kind of being like this, you know, um, standardized, you know, trapped, you know, trapped in a game or uploaded to a game world, uh, fantasy RPG story to like, Oh, this, this has like these really interesting points that, uh, this humor that m makes it a little more interesting, but the humor is very specific. It's, um, this kind of in irreverent body adult humor. Um, that's not going to work. I think there were a couple of reviews where, like, I can't believe the author made these jokes or like, I can't believe this, the author would use these words or like these, these kind of references. Um, and that's kind of what it comes down. Like it either works for you or it doesn't. And that's going to be the deciding factor for you. For me, it was like, oh, okay, I, I get this. I get these jokes. There's some sexualized humor. There's definitely a lot of cursing. Um, there are definitely some jokes that make fun of um, fantasy references and gamers and, and some other things. I think the one, the ones that might be throwing off some people is like, there are a couple of comments that seem racist, um, but they're not. They're, they're cultural references within the gaming world. Um, in that one of the elves is like, oh, I can't believe you would be with the blacks. And the first time I read it, I was like, oh, that's, that's a thing. Um, but as a story, he's like, oh, the elf is referencing the dark elves. Um, and, and that's kind of like a, essentially like a joke in the story. Like, oh, the African-American guys, he's like, oh, I, this is the first time I've ever been told I wasn't black enough. And, you know, it's, it's one of those inside things that's not really like revealed there. So it's a little spoiler about it. If you hit that point, I don't want you to think that, oh, this, the author's being racist necessarily. There is speciesism, but not necessarily the same kind of racism we're talking about. It's all, like I said, it's, it's all if the humor gets you or not. Uh, for me, it was fine. Uh, it gets a score of 7.4 to 10 for me. That's Beta Life Digital Sorcery, book number one. 
a little bit serious with a score of 7.4 out of 10. Um, if I'm extracting the humor portion of it, it's probably like a 7.1, but I think the, the humor element adds enough extra entertainment value that it bumps it up a couple of like decimals for me <laughs> to like a 7.4 out of 10. So there we go. Okay, next is going to be Star Exile Singularity Sci-Fi Liberty Adventure written by Drew Cordell. It is 533 pages a long, massive novel, $3.99 that is available on Kindle Unlimited. So very nicely priced, I got to say. It is a nice seller already. Um, okay, here's the author's description. The isolated eternity system is alone, overpopulated, starved of resources, and dying. A 500-year-old peace treaty between the Dalaxian Alliance and the Sargon Empire is expiring, and the war to end all wars looms. The entire t in the Eternity system will not survive another war. When the Eternity Treaty expires, an uninhabited and coveted no man's land with enough resources to sustain one faction indefinitely is up for grabs, the Eternity Planet. It is the key to survival. The next generation of warfare ignites a digital, bloodless war set in the new game universe of Eternal Line, the brainchild of the combined AI neural nets and the technological prowess of both uh, Dathlaxia and the Solgon. Everything is changing. The war in this game universe will decide which faction will take the Eternity Planet and which will have to go, which will have to forge a grim exodus through the unknown to find a new home. On the fringes of the galactic civilization in the run, Kyle Gannon, a drone operator working for a mining company on the wild fringes of civilization, finds himself on the run from the ghost of his past and the two most powerful governments in the enti entirety eternity system. Sorry. He will have to carve his own path through the stars to forge this new life if he wants any chance of experience in eternity. So there you go. Uh, this is definitely a sci-fi um, little bit of story. Okay, for disclosure, I received an advanced copy for review. I purchased the copy when it became available. Um, here we go. From the author of Status Online, Stratus Online comes a new sci-fi liturgy. The game rules, and here reminds me a lot of Mass Effect, combining sci-fi space storytelling with a RPG action adventure story. Uh, there are aliens, there's techno magic, there's laser guns, spaceship battles, the whole shebang. Um, and the author, on I, I thought that was interesting that the author didn't bother with the character creation section, but instead the first page of story drop you into the action. It literally drops you in the middle of a battle um, that's set in the in-game universe. Um, from there, the main character goes on adventures and it gets drawn deeper and deeper into quest lines that may determine who wins the proxy war between these two galactic powers. Um, so that's essentially the game storyline. Um, IRL, the real life storyline, it's basically space mining with a side of gaming for extra money. Uh, the main character his friend and his friend play the game to hope, hope hoping to earn enough transferable wealth to change vocations from space miners um, to kind of figure out how they're going to improve their, excuse me, improve their lives. And there's this background plot line of like boring human factions vying for dominance through the game, um, a proxy for the real war um, for space, uh, for sparse resources in the galaxy. Um, on the RPG side of things, things are a little bit lighter than I would have liked. Um, the story is more, more the stretch they spent world building, um, and much of the early half of the story feels a little more sci-fi, like with the exception, like the very beginning, like the very first, um, I want to say like five, 10 percent of the story again is really just like you're dropping in this game world and there's a bunch of like thrown at definitions and, and game notification stuff. And that little section that I think is really well done as far as, uh, as far as like showing game mechanics and showing how they're impacting the storyline. And if that had been continued throughout the entire story, I think I would have been a little more pleased, but it kind of is that first section is used as a way of showing, not telling about the game mechanics in the universe. Um, and like doing some light ex um, explanation of like RPG mechanics. Um, but after that though, um, the real life storyline course is completely devoid of RPG stuff because it's in the real world. Um, but even when they go back into the game world, the a lot of the stories just it feels a little more sci-fi-ish than it does like with with like game mechanics actually mattering to the story. And there are different civil locations where it's like, oh, this notification feels unacknowledged in the storyline. Um, it's it's not a horrible thing. It's not. This is still RPG. It's just that, oh, okay, the RPG mechanics were, were a little lighter than I would have and, and liked, I guess. Um, there's still um, character sheets, there's stats, there's item descriptions, there's quest notifications, there's XP, there's levels, all that good stuff is there. And, and after the 60% mark, there's even like some actual class progression and crafting, which I thought was a nice little addition to, to satisfy fans of those particular things in, in, in particular. Um, overall... This is an entertaining sci-fi literary story. Uh, it leans a little more towards the sci-fi side of things. 
Um, the fights in general are, are good. Action filled, nice use of powers, um, interesting tactics. The spaceship battles weren't as well done, I think, for, at least for me. Um, I didn't find them as satisfying. Uh, but character development is really well done, and there's some really neat um, character development that's done with some flashbacks that I thought were like, oh, that's a that's an interesting way of you know telling your character's backstory and, and like you know sprinkling some some real life plot lines that that I thought were nice. Um, for me, it's a score seven point three out of ten. That's Star Exile Singularity, a sci-fi little bit adventure with a score of seven point three out of ten. I had a good time with it. Um, there you go. Okay. Next is going to be Scourge of Souls, The Realms, book number four, an epic little RPG game lit adventure written by C.M. Carney. It is 576 pages, $5.99, and is available on Kindle Limited. Again, another 500 page. Okay, here's the author's description. Griff would give his life for his sister, but saving her could cost him his soul. Griff entered the realms with one mission, to save his sister, Brian. Uh, Bryn, probably. Uh, he didn't want friends. He didn't want responsibilities. He didn't want to care. But even the best laid plans go awry. And after escaping a sentient dungeon and defeating a would-be world conqueror, Griff is no closer to finding Bryn. Then, while mourning the tragic death of a friend and grappling with the burdens of leadership, an ally, Thought Long Dead, returns offering the slimmest of hopes. This hope takes Griff and his friends on a journey through the strange lands where they must outwit a mythical crime syndicate, I'm sorry, a mystical crime syndicate, evade an infallible bounty hunter, and face off against Brian herself, now a goddess no, with no memory of her true self. Griff must triumph over all. If he fails, both he and his sister will not only lose their lives, but they will lose their souls. Okay, so this is the fourth book in the series. Um, essentially, they finally kind of make some progress on that main plot line, which was the impetus of book number one and the main character jumping in this universe. The the storyline with his sister, Bryn, and that's kind of the main focus of the story. Um, and I, I'm happy to say that there is actual advancement by the end of the novel. Um a lot of the story in the beginning, I say the first quarter, is probably focused more around um, story cleanup from the end of book three. Uh, and that story was super epic. It was like this huge, amazing fight and these um, a, a little more fantasy-leaning storylines. And book two, and book four it reminds me a little bit more of of like the first book in the series. That it, it's a little more slice of life. It's a, definitely a smaller adventuring crew, and they're just kind of going on adventures with like a, a goal at the end. And that's what this is, and I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, I think this is done well. The story actually brings in other other concepts. I think there's a short story called. Um, Dead must die. It's a, it was a side story in this universe, and I think this this novel actually brings that back into the main series, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, and w with with like a, a, a nice group dungeon knife there. There's also um, I was happy to see some progression in some of the RPG mechanics for the soul magic, which was nice, and also like some new mechanics for um, for the soul magic and the lore skill and the perk market, which that was kind of neat. So some really good advancement on the RPG mechanics side as well. Um, overall, it's an interesting story for the fans of the series. Again, it's a little bit less epic in scale than book three, which is perfectly fine by me. Um, I'm not sure all the, all, all the fan readers and fans were like huge. Um, they Not everybody enjoyed that part of it. Like for, for a lot of fans, some of the reviews for a book, they were like, oh, this this doesn't really feel like a little RPG um, for some of from parts of book three. And I think this one definitely returns to the things that um, people enjoyed in the book one. So there we go. Um, so there we go. I had a good time with it. Entertaining because it scores 7.5 out of 10. That's Scourge of Souls, The Realms Book 4, an epic little BG game lit adventure. So there we go. Okay. Uh, on to our sixth review. It's going to be Gemini's Crossing, a fantasy little BG game lit adventure in Nora Online, book number one, written by Arlo Adams. Okay, this is 504 pages, $4.99, it is available on Kindle Limited, and here's the author's description. After learning he has just months to live, Gemini Fowler is granted one shot to cheat death when billionaire game developer offers to transfer his consciousness into a virtual realm. The catch. The only current VR with the capability to get him to receive him is the unreleased video game in Nora Online, and Gemini must survive until level 10 or be completely wiped from the servers and existence. Welcome to Enora Online, where virtual is reality. And honestly, I was super bugged by that. By the, by the ship, like, oh, if he dies in the game, he dies and he dies forever in the first ten levels. Because that immediately told me 
this main character is not going to die in the first 10 levels. Um, at least not, you know, because there's already a book two on pre-order. There's a book three out for pre-order. So I'm like, okay, that aspect was kind of, you know, a little annoying. Um, this story uh, is definitely better than the cover makes it seem. Like, the story covers for this were like, they're a little, like, hmm, uh, they are what they are. Um, but the story is definitely better than what the covers kind of make them appear. Um, I'd say the most unique aspect of the story is the game mechanic where uh, the main character can switch classes by switching weapons. That's something you've seen in other RPGs, like actual video game RPGs. I thought that was a nice pull on the story. It's handled, it's handled, you know, okayly. Like I thought it was an interesting mechanic. I don't think it's um, used as much as it could have been, mostly because like the difference between the classes that the main character ends up using aren't really like that huge of a difference. Like he basically goes between like a ranger, a warrior, and an assassin. I'm like, none of those classes seem like they would be that different. Like each has like unique little abilities, but they're not all particularly trained well. They're not all used to the fullest. Like the main character essentially focuses on unequipping one particular weapon and like advancing the XP for that particular class and those skills. Um, and as far as that progression goes, it makes sense within the story. It makes very logical sense. I was like, oh, but even that like unique aspect is like, oh, that's an interesting concept. And how it's actually developed is... Um, not as, I want to say, like, it's, it, it's very logically progression. Like, you can't focus on every single class you get. You know what I mean? And that's what ends up happening. So I'm like, okay, it is what it is. Um, the RPG mechanics on the story, other than that part, fairly standard. You see them throughout the story. It's very consistent. So this is definitely an RPG. Um, there is a pretty good action for the most part. And there's a nice dungeon dive in the story. So that's, those are the things I liked about the story. On to the things that didn't work for me. Um, honestly, the first 25% of the story is almost entirely set up. Um, it's, it's a part of it is the real world setup where the main character, it's revealed who he's dying and he's, he's going to give him this chance to like upload his rank. Cause only has like three months to live. Um, and then there's like a slight romance and there's a bunch of real world stuff that isn't poorly written. It's just that it doesn't matter to the rest of the story. Like none of the stuff that happens there besides getting the main character in the, in the game world really ever carries over is even and like there are a couple of references to the stuff that had happened in the, in the real world but for the most part it's completely ignored and it doesn't matter to the rest of the game world story so i'm like oh that's, that's disappointing um the rest of that first 20 percent is is set up for the game world and there's there's i don't want to say set up in that there's a lot of description of what the game world's supposed to be like from the ceo of the company from the designers from like the ai um, uh, and I was honestly expecting more when I actually got into the game world. Um, and I mean, it's, and this is not to say that it's, it's, it's a badly written story in any shape or it's just that the, the beginning setup of the story sets up some expectations that just aren't fulfilled. Like, and I, and I mean this and that it's heavily kind of beaten into the reader repeatedly in that first time of 25% that the RPG game is going to be. It was created by this amazing, superior, advanced AI that is not only sentient, but it has created an entire world so realistic that the programs who looked at it um, practically resigned, realizing that their jobs are redundant. And this isn't, it's kind of a, a, that's a paraphrasing from the actual novel. Um, this game world is supposed to be like full of dynamic quests, rich culture, independent AI creatures with thousands of years of history to inform who they were as people. And unfortunately, once you actually got to the game world, that's kind of the opposite of what actually ended up being, at least in this first novel. The world feels culturally empty. Um, part of it is, is is the fact that you're not getting any big cities in this particular novel. You're not like getting a chance to like see larger cultures. Um, but the other part is that even the few people the main character talked to, they felt relatively one-dimensional, like like having an attitude or just being, you know, grumpy and, and ultra violent or like being just like flat bad guys or whatever. Um, and there's, I mean, there's, there's sort of an attempt with the secondary, um, harem characters, like, Oh, flesh them out a little bit. But even then I was like, Oh, not, not super, not nearly as thorough and like well fleshed out of a world as like that first 25% kind of beat you over the head saying it was going to be. And that, so I was, I was a little disappointed in that regards. Um, and also the, there are many places in the story where it felt like the game were a little more game-like than I thought 
based on early descriptions. And I don't mean that the game mechanics are not well used or not shown, but rather that uh, the story felt like it was kind of on rails um, with quests leading the main character down particular story paths, him getting obviously under gear, skills, and magic. I mean, there's literally a point in the story where the main character's handed up a magical bag of holding that he has no business having. Um, and with a bunch of like high, like decent gear that give him new skills, new quests, new classes. I'm like that, that, that shouldn't exist in this particular scenic. And it felt forced. So the main character could have these, these advanced options. I was like, Oh, that, I mean, I would expect that in an on the rails game and not in the world that was getting described to me by the first 25% saying, Oh, this is an open world. That's like so full of like culture and, and interesting things. And you can do anything you want to. And you're going to feel like you're in the real, like a real essentially portal fantasy world. And that's not what any and end up being the story. It's like, oh, so it is what it is. And also, um, there's like several places in the story where like, oh, I don't feel like the game mechanics are being followed here. Um, one in particular really bugged me and that the main character faces off against like a level, he's like a level, I want to say like three or four, I can't remember. But he's facing off against level nine hunters, NPC hunters. Um, and he's hiding from them. And these are... Like I said, these are these these are native to the world. So as far as they're concerned, they've been living their entire lives in this fantasy world, hunting and killing and developing skills and the levels and classes and all that stuff for their entire lives. And they're level nine now. Um, and him, he's he's only a couple levels. He hasn't developed any skills yet. Um, yet he can hide from them with his essentially non-existent hide skill. Or eventually, after the scene goes, he gets a level one hide skill. But he's able to fool these uh, fool these level nine. NPC hunters. I'm like, that doesn't make sense according to like the game mechanics that were expressed. I'm like, but at the same time, I would have kind of messed the straight. He was like murdered right away. And that's kind of what it came down. Like, oh, do I murder my main character because it makes sense in the game mechanic world? Or do I fudge things a little bit so that he, he lives and, you know, the story advances. And I think those are several places in the story. Like those that, 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 um, that set up like, oh, if the main character dies before level 10, he dies forever kind of informed where the story was going to go. And I'm like, oh, that that doesn't quite vibe with the way the game mechanic are set up in the run. That, that bothered me a little bit. Um, also, the last 25% of the story, it's mostly harem. Um, it's no explicit sex scenes. There is sex, though, though. Um, there's some quest cleanup, and there's a hook for book two, but that's, that's what it is. And then the harem stuff really just wasn't my thing, especially the way that it's set up here and that it, it feels, again, a little bit forced. And then essentially, <laughs> it kind of felt like every woman that the main character saved just fell in love with him and wanted to be his permanent companion. And it filled out the roles in his group that he he couldn't do for some reason or gave him special skills and spells that he didn't really earn. Um, and it, again, it also really felt against the core game rules that were already established. Um, and I'm like, he has a he has a level 10 charisma where he has 10 points in charisma, which is how all of his other skills stats put together. But... It was like clearly said at the beginning of the story, like, oh, the only thing this influences is like your bartering skill. And I'm like, it doesn't, it's not supposed to influence social skills. I'm like, oh, that's, I mean, it's, it's obviously set up for the story, but at the same time, I feel like you're not following your game rules to some, you know, to some degree. Um, so there you go. Overall, I enjoyed the setup of the story. I thought it was really well done. Um, even though it doesn't really matter once the main character is uploaded to the game. However, it set up expectations that weren't fulfilled, which was a disappointment to me. Um, that plus the harem stuff that just wasn't interesting to me meant that I this story just wasn't good for me. Uh, so for me, it could score 6 out of 10. Other people might enjoy it. Um, if you don't mind harem stuff or if you actually actively like harem stuff, you might enjoy this more than I do. Uh, but for me... Get a score 6 out of 10. That's Gemini's Crossing, a fantasy little bitty game lit adventure. A Nora Online book number one with a score of 6 out of 10. There you go. Okay. Last but not least, folks, it is The Dungeon Traveler written by Alston Sleet. It is 282 pages, $2.99. Very nicely priced. Also available on Kindle Limited. And here's the author's description. I spent most of my life trying to get by with whatever happiness I could. That included alcohol, food, and porn. My death was unpleasant and humiliating. However, death is something we all need to go through. A bit like a proctology exam. Necessary, but never anything one wants to go through while it's happening. However, death was supposed to be the end of it all. Either way, the pain, suffering, and failures were supposed to be over. I was supposed to wink out and perhaps take a trip to a lovely afterlife. No. I ended up as a small stone strapped to a table while a pimple-faced teenager rubbed my facets and told me how lovely I was. 
the last time I checked, birth wasn't supposed to be as, an, as embarrassing as death. Life as a dungeon core isn't all bad. I, watch, I like watching lizard love triangles and snooping on mil militaristic dwarves, though there is that issue where I'm trying to free myself from the entanglements of the gods. Okay, yeah, that last one might be a problem. And that's the novel description. There you go. Um, you can even tell from that that there's a certain sense of humor to the story, which I actually liked. Um, this is a, a dungeon core story where the dungeon travels around instead of staying in one location. I actually think this solves a nice uh, story bottom that a lot of dungeon cores hit eventually, and that they're stuck in one place, and there's a finite number of locals to interact with. Um, it does create other potential storyline problems in that there's uh, like readers investing in characters that they may never see again, or not spending enough time with a group to flesh them out a lot. Still, I think the author does a good job. Um, overall, though, this is essentially a dungeon core novel. Um, there are a few other like subplots of like gods and goddesses and their domains of worship and stuff with the human kingdom. Um, but it's basically a dungeon core novel where a sentient core creates a dungeon with traps and challenges. They reward adventurers who pass with levels and loot, and they kill those that don't. And they cre and gain power and strength from those kills. Um, all, the w all the while trying to maintain a balance between drawing and adventurers, but not killing so many that people seek to destroy the dungeon. That's what the story is. Um, overall, good stuff. The game mechanics are seen throughout the story. Lots of notifications. Um, I like that there's a space man manipulation uh, as like the dungeon core's power, so that was a nice little twist instead of just him having um, magically known dungeon skills. He's like, oh, he actually has, he gained a skill and he's using it to make his dungeon better and more powerful. Um, and even though the group's adventures um, that come to the dungeon rotate as it travels, there's still time put into each to flesh out each race or group. So they feel distinct and interesting. So I thought, I, I literally think that the author did a really good job as far as like, um, the groups that come through the story as the dungeon location shifts. Um, he puts in the time to at least make you feel like they're well fleshed out cultures and characters. Um, so kudos to that. Uh, for me, how do you come with it? it? It's a dungeon core novel, which I'm always a fan of. Um, it does the RPG stuff well, and it does the cultural and uh, character element well enough. So I'm like, oh, and, but there's also the added like twist of like, oh, this is how the author is solving this very common dungeon realm in making the the entrance to the dungeon change locations and makes it part of the story and makes and incorporates into like this larger, um, potentially very interesting plotline system. Like, oh, the gods being involved and their domains like being attached to the story and increasing their power. So like, there's a lot, a lot of like interesting uh, potential plotlines for the series. Had a time with it, gets a score of 7.6 out of 10. Um, that's actually the highest score of the entire show. So the Dungeon Story got the highest score of the show um, with 7.6 out of 10. That's the Dungeon Traveler uh, with a score of 7.6 out of 10. So there you go. That's it. That's the show. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, thanks for listening, for watching. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, on our webpage. We have a link in the show notes for you guys to follow and click on. Um, and again, if you just want to help support the podcast without it costing anything, um, if you're interested in any of these, in any of the uh, the, the books we've talked about today, uh, click on the links in the show notes uh, to buy them. That gives us a couple pennies. Um, anytime you make a purchase with those links, Amazon pays us. You guys, as readers, don't pay us. Um, but those little pennies add up to dollars and help fund, you know, help support the podcast and cover the costs of like putting it out there. Um, that's also how we stay, you know, ad free and free for everybody to enjoy the podcast. Um, there you go. And if you, uh, thanks for hanging out with you folks. And if you uh, want to support us in any other way, shape or form, you can find out all the ways you do. So at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. And again, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. And until we can hang out again, ladies and gentlemen, remember to go read some lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>